Okay, I'm, I'm seeing a plateau at about 50. So I think we're going to get started. People usually filter in in the first couple minutes, which is okay. Um, so this is our monthly department meeting and resident case conference. Um, so just to briefly go over the agenda, um, I will uh, tell you the October Grand Rounds schedule. Um, I want to remind people that uh, the MEXAP review, which happens at 7.30 before Grand Rounds, um, is actually going quite well. It's on Zoom. It's very well attended. So those of you who might not have been able to make it to that meeting physically in the past, um, consider joining the Zoom. If you'd like the link, uh, contact our office. Um, it, um, uh, it really is a great meeting um, uh, and they go topic by topic. The topic for this month is, uh, is pulmonary medicine. Uh, they're gonna do a brief epidemiology update um, and then uh, move on to the case conference. So very quickly, the coming Grand Rounds topics. Uh, October 1st, uh, we have uh, Dr. Gesiak. This is gonna be very important. The uh, proponent test is going to undergo a fundamental change, uh, and we'll all need to know that uh, in terms of interpreting the result. Um, the 8th, it's a case conference uh, run by Hospital Medicine. Uh, October 15th, Dr. Dabedin, uh, our interventional radiology, uh, will be telling us um, a little bit about interventional radiology. The 22nd, Dr. Eichel is talking about prostate cancer screening. Um, and then on the 29th, we have five grand rounds in October. Uh, we come back to our monthly uh, department meeting. So with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and allow Dr. Lesho to go up uh, with his epidemiology update. Right. We now have 81 participants, by the way. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to share, let's see, this one. Uh, is this, the, what do you guys see? Do you guys see universal masking? Yes, you're on. Okay, good. Uh, okay, good morning, everybody. I'm, as usual, going to go very fast on this. I don't want to encroach on the other presenters speaking, but... Uh, Dr. Lesho, just go, go full screen, though, on your presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Better? Uh, wait, wait. Better? Okay. Um, I want to get started, uh, take, take some time away from Grand Rounds, just for a couple of safety reminders and a couple of uh, new updates in, in the world of COVID. So just uh, one safety reminder, don't forget about masking. Um, last couple of days, Joint Commission was here doing a, uh, a targeted survey for the Joint Center of Excellence. And so, although they're focusing on certain areas, if they see violations anywhere that are, that are blatant, they can, they can call those out. Uh, also, don't forget about uh, reminding a patient, especially if you're going in to see a COVID, uh, um, a SARS-infected patient, that uh, you know they should wear their masks out of out of safety for you as well. Uh, patients should also wear their mask when they're when they're going out being transported, and most of the time there's a lot of compliance with this, and they're they're fine. Uh, but being on the rounds, I see patients not always not always masked when their provider walks in. We also uh, we also don't forget about eye protection, okay? Face shield or goggles. Uh, if you're gonna be doing an aerosolizing procedure or some other thing, definitely on a known COVID positive patient or someone of uncertain status, face shield is preferred. But don't forget to keep your eyes covered. If your eyes are not covered and down the road, you've had contact, uh, the patient that you've had contact with is te uh, tests positive for a new infection, then, then you're in exposure and you're at elevated risk. All right, here's some bad news before we get to some good news. Uh, just a reminder about our central line associated bloodstream infection rates. If we continue on this trajectory, 
we are going to be threatened with a, with a penalty from CMS, uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, and value-based purchasing. Um, so we, we just want to bring everybody's attention. You know, culture, uh, culture mindfully. If you're going to culture somebody that has a Foley catheter in uh, for a while, more than two days, take out the Foley, put a new Foley in and do that. Try not to have a Foley at all. Try, don't forget about uh, non-indwelling alternatives like the PureWick. We present this at our uh, monthly infection prevention meeting. This is a heat map of where, you know, 5,500 you see there, that's where the, the location of some of the clads. And also importantly, um, it's, it's, about, it's about dwell time. So it's well known that the longer you have a catheter in, the more likely you're at risk for infection. That's what we're seeing here. This is the time to, from insertion to event. And you see how, you know, those, those days there in the pink suggesting that the catheters are in uh, quite a bit and quite a bit long, I mean, and also it might be a maintenance issue uh, rather than an insertion issue. Okay, getting on to uh, serology. I know there's a lot of questions about serology and I wanna call your attention to this nice article recently came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine. It's a very nice review. I just took the liberty of summarizing all the key points that that article makes. First, molecular testing <clears throat> is the way to go for diagnosis, but it has, it's not a perfect test. Antibody testing has some potential, but most of the time on, for you, for a clinical provider, patient-provider interaction, it's not going to provide meaningful uh, uh, data. It helps us epidemiologically, but in terms of how we're gonna treat somebody differently, and this is important when I get to the next couple slides about test antibody testing results. It should not be used as the sole basis for diagnosis or because we don't know what, you know, it's too, it's it, it, this, the situation that we're in is, is too recent to know what, you know, if these mean uh, immunity. So you can't say, okay, my antibody or his antibody test was positive. Therefore, I don't have to do any PPE or anything like that. So we, don't, we wanna keep that, that message strong and clear. Uh, there's about 18 at last count commercially available antibody tests, and there's a lot of variability. Uh, the gold standard is plaque reduction neutralization. Almost nobody can do those because of the danger that, that they're in. So we, urgent research is needed to determine what are correlates of immunity against SARS. The current antibody test that Dr. Walsh and his team have developed that's available under only uh, in, um, IRB protocol by consent is a standard ELISA test that detects both the uh, uh, antibodies to the S and, 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 N, and the N proteins. And so, to remind you, uh, when we had an outbreak on 7800, we, 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 we asked for volunteers and about 180 page, uh, staff volunteered. And we found that if you were involved in an outbreak, an unexpected outbreak, you were three times more likely to have positive antibodies than you were even if you had sustained duty on a COVID, dedicated COVID ward. So it's important uh, PPE to wear um, and, and the risk of, a, of, a, of an untoward exposure is much greater than uh, sustained uh, uh, time spent on a dedicated COVID ward. That's just a reminder. So uh, residents now have taken uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Tahir, Wakas Tahrir and others, uh, uh, have now um, are, are involved in a serology project. And uh, again, limited time, limited resources, limited testing resources. So what we thought we would do was limit it to what we kind of um, arbitrarily defined as the high risk employees. And we thought, we thought the emergency department would qualify, respiratory therapists would qualify. Got 180 volunteers and we had over out of 180, about a 5% positivity rate. So, and you can see the breakdown there. I have to clarify, and I have to emphasize, this is preliminary results. You guys are the first to see it. The residents are gonna go more into it. We don't know how many of these are occupational exposures or exposures outside. That's, stay tuned for that, but that's the, that's the first cut. RNs, patient care techs, 1MD, et cetera, and you could, you could read that. We then have some interesting and, and reassuring results of an environmental assessment that we did, with the objective being to assess the level of SARS in acute and long-term care environments. 
And also our objective was to evaluate effectiveness of routine and contingency-based cleaning. What I mean by contingency-based cleaning is sometimes we have to use professional remediation services because uh, environmental services people are, are in short supply. Uh, they, have ex you know, they have expressed concerns about going into uh, 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 patient rooms that, that, that have COVID, sars cov infected patients. And so there's, there's a lot of challenges uh, with cleaning. The good news, and so this is the breakdown. We were able to collect, and this is, this is very notable, and this is due uh, no small support from the laboratory. In times of, uh, uh, of such restricted COVID testing and such shortages of reagents, I think it's, uh, it, you know, this, this, this bears testament to how great our lab is. And I'm not a paid advertisement for the lab, but we had 400 samples. So 200 at the acute care hospital, uh, broken down into controlled sampling and random sampling. Random sampling means we just went on the ward with no respect to whenever the ward was cleaned or the room was cleaned. We just went there unannounced and we took random samples. Controlled samples is when we had, we had an arrangement set up with nursing immediately after a patient that had SARS-CoV-2 left the room, was discharged or transferred, nursing paged our, our, our team. We went up there and we sampled the pre-cleaning surfaces. And then Scott Sleeper and his team went up and cleaned it as they usually do. And we, immediately after they were done cleaning, we went back in and resampled the same surfaces. So that, that's what controlled is. We also used three enhancements, UV light, gas alone, and UV plus gas. And then you see, you could see the sample breakdown. And again, I, we don't have a lot of time and we'll probably be going over this again, but I just wanna give you guys a preview. This is hot off the press. We were still evaluating the statistics and everything last night. This is the same breakdown at Hill Haven, which is what we used for the long-term care facility. We took 200 samples there, all right? Here are the results. So, um, you know, everybody knows, or or it's fairly well known that nursing homes have have borne a huge brunt of the morbidity and mortality, and various reasons we know. But one of the hypotheses we had was, well, maybe the environment is more contaminated. Uh, this, there are results do not support that hypothesis. So the, the, the contamination was no different at a long-term care facility than it was at an acute care hospital. If you look at it as the percent of surfaces that were positive on the first bullet, or you look at it as the mean cycle threshold, that's the, uh, that's the RNA load, if you will. The higher the cycle threshold, the, the lower the amount of viral RNA. Random sampling, uh, no different between acute and long-term care. Control sampling, again, in the interest of time, I, I just wanted you to be aware of this. I'll get to the clinical bottom line at the next slide. But uh, up, in the, up in the upper right there where you see the red uh, confidence interval bars, that just shows you how there's no, no meaningful difference, no significant difference between the contamination when you look at hospital and a nursing home. The one below that is interesting and it shows that unlike gas, which may be effective, gas and UV light are enhancements, but they're also kind of also contingency based because we use them as an extra safety. So whenever a patient that has C. diff, for example, or is on CRE precautions or has COVID is discharged, uh, environmental services use the UV light to enhance that. And you can see that it, that slide indicates that not, not only it probably does it kill the virus, we don't even know if this RNA is of an infectious nature, but previously we have shown that DNA in E. coli has been correlated with healthcare associated infections. But not only does the UV light kill it, it probably chops it up so badly that it doesn't even be detected in unlike. Finally, that slide line plot shows that it's a messy world out there in the world of evaluating cleaning. And there are to account. One of them is the time spent cleaning. And in, at, at, at Hill Haven, we looked at three different disinfectant red dots chemical but it also depends no matter what chemical you use if you just use that chemical improperly you don't spend any time cleaning it's not going to mean anything that's what the left side shows so what's the clinical bottom line level of contamination is similar higher on the COVID words I didn't get into that 29 percent uh, of dialysis surfaces randomly sampled had viral RNA on it again I don't know what that means but it's out there 
Notably, our cleaning uh, protocols are effective. UV destroys, and uh, we don't have time to go into this, but remediation services may not necessarily be a cost-effective solution when you have a critical shortage of UBS staff. This is, a, this is a depressing joint statement that came out two days ago. You could read it. These slides will come out later, but it says, basically in the United States, we're in a worst case scenario uh, with, with COVID and, and what's happening. And finally, um, I wanna end with a safety note. Uh, this uh, link up here is a link to uh, guidelines for parents, everybody, as we come up on the holidays, Halloween, uh, Day of the Dead and Thanksgiving. And you may think that certain um, things are pretty safe, like trick-or-treating. Well, I was surprised to learn that that's in a moderate or a high-risk activity. I, I encourage you, if, if you're going to have holiday traditions and gatherings, um, which we all like to do, is to check out that link. It's quite helpful, and it has details and alternatives and what to do if you go to a party and you get sick. So it's very helpful. Okay, thank you, guys. Yeah, so real quick, uh, our number of uh, participants has gone up to 132. Dr. Lesher, you can stop sharing your, your screen. Um, and while the other screen goes up, um, um, there was a question on the chat. Uh, if you have a question, please try to put it on the Q&A side because they're easier to manage there. Uh, Dr. Sham asked, uh, how contagious are these RNA uh, samples and you can put on the next presentation while we're doing while we're answering okay great that's 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 the question right yeah. um, and so uh, we have because of a, a number of studies that are coming out uh, we can answer that question but about a month ago we had no idea it would be this most scientifically accurate answer again this is a detected, this is the texted signature of the virus that's been there. We don't know if it's infective, uh, infective. So there, uh, and the problem with SARS-CoV is it's dangerous and it's a, it requires BSL. So normally when we do these studies, we can actually also combine it with cultures. So it's very nice, in tandem you have a PCR and you have a culture test and you see how well they correlate. Can't do that here. We can look at the other studies that have shown that if you look at that cycle threshold value, the CT value, remember, it's an inverse relationship. So for those that aren't familiar with PCR like this, it, it's, a, it's a rough estimate of how many times you have to try to find the, the, the RNA in this case. So if it's 20, you only had to amplify it 20 times, but if it's 40, it's negative because that's that's a predetermined standard for negativity because after 40 times, you're, you're amplifying it way too hard and you're amplifying stuff that might not be there truly. So a long-winded way of saying when it's above 20 or 24, the studies, the few studies that were able to correlate that with to try to grow it, no matter when, no matter how, and this was done on actual patients. So they took their respiratory samples, they cultured their respiratory samples, and they also did their PCR at the same time. And once it got to about 25 or 26, they could never, they, I shouldn't say never, but in all the studies that did that, they were unable to culture it when it was that above that cutoff. And then so you say, well, what were the CTs at, at our, most of the time the mean CTs were in the low to mid thirties. Uh, so again, uh, so Mark, you can go ahead and put up your slide. So yeah, if there are other questions, um, you know, send them on the Q&A line. There was one that came in about um, uh, does the UV light uh, uh, eliminate COVID? And I'll let Dr. Lesho answer that online uh, okay. while we start the uh, presentation. So here's our case. Good morning, everyone. My name is Samar Thakkar. I'm one of the second year residents in internal medicine. Today, I'm sharing screen with Dr. Mohan Rao, who is an expert in cardiac electrophysiology, and Dr. Bipul Baibao, who is an expert in general cardiology and advanced imaging. So we are starting with a case. So a 66-year-old female came to cardiology office with the history of hypertension and migraine. And the reason of the visit was like ongoing dizziness and recent echo showing RV dysfunction. 
So patient reported this dizziness going on for about 20 years. She described these episodes as unsteadiness lasting for about 10 to 15 seconds. And usually while changing positions, but also sometimes while prolonged standing and walking. So what happened that over the last one year, her symptoms became more frequent, lasting for up to like one to two hours. And she did also report a recent episode of pre-syncope, but she denied for any episode of syncope or falls. Uh, family history was positive for sudden cardiac death in brother at the age of 62. She was non-smoker, denied for any alcohol drinking or any recreational drugs. So on review of system, it was positive for migraine and dizziness, but she denied for any chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitation, orthopnea, PND, no nausea, vomiting or diarrhea, and no pedal edema. You're not muted, right? Yeah. Okay. So on physical exam, um, she was an overweight female, BMI 29. The rest of the vitals were normal. And on other exam, including cardiovascular, normal S1, S2, no murmur, no JVD, no pedal edema, and also normal neurological exam. So the plan was, uh, yeah, before we had this uh, limited echo done at the outside hospital, which showed normal LV size and wall motion and EF of 55 to 60%, but it did show uh, reduced RV function and mild to moderate tricuspid regurgitation. So this was the EKG done in the office. So as you can see, uh, uh, patient had normal sinus rhythm. Uh, you see diffuse T-wave inversions, including the chest leads, uh, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, as well as the limb leads, 2, 3, AVF. And you also see left axis deviation if you see lead, v, uh, lead 1 and AVF. And also some PVCs here. So this was the read of this EKG. So the plan was to repeat TT with bubble study and do carotid duplex. She was also counseled regarding strict blood pressure checks, adequate hydration, and changing position slowly. And she was sent home with follow-up in uh, next four weeks. Now what happened after 10 days, she went to emergency department with chest pain and dizziness. She described chest pain as a substernal squeezing pain lasting for initial 30 seconds, it was very severe but then it resolved over the next one hour. And this time symptoms started while she was just sitting and watching TV. Uh, so this time EKG showed this rhythm. So as you can see, there are more frequent PVCs and these are PVCs because there is discordance between QRS and STT segment. You can see the compensatory pause here at the lead uh, after BVC. Uh, you see the same uh, diffuse T-wave inversions in chest leads as well as the limb leads. Okay. Um, so yeah, this was the read of this EKG and then you can see this diffuse uh, T-wave inversions. Okay. So two sets of troponin were drawn and they were negative. And after that patient became chest pain free. So she took the discharge with close follow-up with PCP and cardiologist. Well, again, after 10 days, she went to emergency department and this time with severe substernal chest pain with higher intensity describing as the worst pain of her life and radiating to both the side of the chest. And this time rhythm showed this. So I'm just gonna go over this EKG. You can see it's a regular monomorphic wide complex tachycardia, can be ventricular tachycardia. Uh, so points showing it's ventricular tachycardia so if you see the extreme QRS axis deviation, positive in AVR, negative in two, three AVF, also known as Northwest axis. Uh, uh, you also, there are a couple of signs positive. So from onset to nadir, it's more than 100 millisecond showing Brugada sign. And also you see the notching of the S wave, Josephine sign. Uh, and usually with VT, you see RBBB pattern, that's RSR prime. But here in this case, you see R prime is taller than R, which shows true RBBB. So possibly this VT is arising from left ventricle. And it's also the transition is like apical exit. You see that uh, negative deflection in V5, V6. 
basic. And Dr. Rao is gonna go over all the details of ele electrophysiology as well. So immediately amiodarone was started and she was taken for right and left heart cath and which showed non-obstructive coronary disease, normal cardiac index, normal right-sided pressures, and no evidence of shunting. She also had CT angiogram to rule out PE, which it did. And she had a TT done here, which showed normal LV size and function with EF of 60%, but did show severely dilated RV and mild RV systolic dysfunction. And Dr. Baiba is gonna go over the imaging details. So there was a concern of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, commonly known as ARVC, and therefore patient underwent cardiac MRI. And it did show subtricuspid dyskinesia, dyskinesia of RV apex and other RV free wall, showing RV ejection fraction 33%, and there was also some involvement of uh, left ventricle. So she did meet the modified test for uh, cardiac MRI criteria for ARVC, Later on, patient underwent ICD placement for secondary prevention, and amiodaron was switched to sotalol, which is most commonly used antiarrhythmic for ARVC. And later on, it was found that her nephew was diagnosed with ARVC in his 20s. And therefore, patient was offered genetic testing for PKP2 mutation. So it's a gene codes for desmosomes, involved with cell-to-cell -cell interactions and sodium channel complex known as placophylin 2, and which turned out positive in this case. Okay. So now I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Rao, who's gonna go over the disease as well as the electrophysiological aspect. Uh, Dr. Rao. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, uh, uh, great presentation, Sam. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, uh, case also. And uh, it is somewhat sometimes rare to actually see a patient uh, of her age, or over the age of 50 to 60, uh, presenting with this uh, condition. So, um, I'm going to kind of go over a little overview of uh, the um, ARVC, or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Um, Somewhat of a misnomer because nowadays we call these more arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies because in the past we thought it was only the right ventricle that was involved, but uh, we now know that even the left ventricle also is involved in many patients. So what is ARVC? So as I said, uh, for nomenclature reasons, uh, and uh, I guess uh, historically these are called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathies. In some places they call it arrhythmogenic right ventricular um, uh, so inheritable, it's basically an inheritable cardiomyopathy um, and it's related to mutations that occur in the genes that encode for the desmosomes like Sam mentioned. And uh, there are several of these proteins and uh, there's actually several genes that could be involved that Dr. Bible will go over. And uh, these proteins uh, are usually involved in cell-to-cell uh, -cell adhesion um, and it's uh, required for the normal myocardial syncytium to maintain its uh, structure. So what happens in these patients is that due to the disarray of the cells that occur, um, there is an inflammation and progressive uh, fibro fatty replacement of the right ventricular myocardium, eventually leading to loss of uh, healthy myocardium. Uh, this ends up leading to myocardial scar, uh, predom predominantly in the RV, but it could happen in the LV as well. And uh, obviously scar leads to myocardial dysfunction. Uh, again, due to loss of uh, myocardium. Um, and this could include significant wall motion abnormalities, RV dilatation, RV aneurysms, a reduction in the RV ejection fraction. And, um, and similarly, there could be uh, LV dysfunction that could take place with similar types of changes. Um, the substrate uh, related to scar and fibro fatty infiltrate, infiltrative disease um, ends up being a substrate for ventricular ectopy and ventricular tachycardia. So the ventricular ectopy occurs uh, because there's a sick myocardium at the edges of the scar um, that become hyperactive and uh, calcium overload takes place in a lot of these cells uh, as a result of which uh, they start causing PVCs. Um, and it could either cause a focal uh, ventricular tachycardia uh, from the same site where the PVC is occurring, or they, could call re they can cause a reentrant tachycardias because of, of the scar. 
And uh, eventually it leads to an increased risk of ventricular fibrillation and sudden cardiac death. So the, in terms of the phenotypes, the classic phenotype is characterized by isolated RV involvement, but uh, the biventricular variants have been more recently um, described and we're seeing them more frequently now, especially because of cardiac MRI. So you have the balance type where you have both right and left involved somewhat equally. And then you have the right dominant and left dominant involvements. And then you have the LV phenotype where you have isolated LV involvement uh, without any clinical uh, demonstrable disease in the RV. So, and we actually had a case recently um, that was predominantly LV involvement without any RV involvement. So the, the typical clinical features are that they present earlier in age. I could occur in the pediatric age group, but typically 20 to 40 years of age. So our patient was uh, out of this age group in terms of initial presentation. Um, one of the a classic hallmark, hallmark uh, history is exercise-induced syncope. Uh, in this patient, she was actually a hiker and she liked to do a lot of hiking. Um, um, it's not clear whether that is what induced her um, VT, but uh, it's uh, interesting that these patients end up getting uh, exercise-induced VT that typically ends up causing syncope. Um, they have palpitations that could be related to the PVCs itself, could be due to non-sustained VT or even sustained VT. Or the first presentation can be sudden cardiac death due to ventricular fibrillation. And we've had patients who were running. Um, uh, I had a one patient who was running on a lunch break and basically just dropped dead uh, and uh, ended up getting CPR on the street. So uh, th that could be the first presentation as well. So as uh, Sam pointed out in the EKG of this patient, um, some of the classical findings is repolarization abnormalities. And as we know that the, the, the QT segment is, what, is where we see the cardiac repolarization. So typically we see T wave inversions in lead V1 and V2 out past V3. So you can see T wave inversions in normal patients uh, in V1 and V2, but if you start getting, uh, T wave inversions beyond V3, you have to start thinking about some sort of cardiomyopathy. Now, this could be seen in patients under the age of 14. So T wave inversions are allowed in the pediatric age group uh, beyond V3, but in adults, it usually suggests that there is some underlying cardiomyopathy. And obviously there are various other cardiomyopathies that cause this as well, but it is uh, classically seen in patients who have ARVD. Another thing that is interesting is and we hardly see this, but it is described in the literature. If you can see here in, in V1, at the end of the QRS, there's a notching here. And this is actually called the epsilon wave, which is also a sign of uh, depolarization abnormalities. And trying to blow it up here, at the end of this V1, you can see here that there's a notching at the uh, end of this uh, QRS complex. So, and that's called an epsilon wave. And if you see that, um, that is, a, you know, there's a 90% plus sensitivity and specificity if you have this, but it's rare that you find this in uh, patients uh, with this uh, condition. So uh, this is the EKG that the patient presented with later on. And some things I wanted to note on this is that uh, the patient has low voltage QRS, which usually suggests that there would be, might be some LV involvement. Um, so in this patient, there were some low voltage QRS complexes in the limb leads, uh, even in some of the uh, anterior leads. And as you can note here, that this patient had uh, frequent PVCs uh, and the morphology of this PVC is actually very similar uh, to the VT that we, we noted. So this is an EKG of a typical VT that we see in patients who have ARVC. Um, we typically see a left bundle branch block type of morphology of VT. And left bundle branch block morphology VT typically occurs because it's coming from the right ventricle. So this patient has, in, in this VT, there's what we call an inferior axis, which means it is going from the top of the ventricle towards the bottom of the ventricle. And it is a left bundle branch block morphology. So this is more of a classical VT that we see in patients who have uh, ARVC. However, in this patient, we actually had a different type of VT that had a right bundle branch block morphology and a superior axis, which means you're going away from the inferior leads and you're going towards AVR. 
So going away from the, from the diaphragmatic surface of the heart towards the base of the heart. And this suggests that this VT was coming from the left ventricle, suggesting that in this patient, there was left ventricular involvement. Um, and that's just based on the VT that you can make that out. And also, as he mentioned, it is going away from the apex as well in this patient because V6, V5 and V6 typically overlie the apex. So if it's negative in V5 and V6 and the QRS is going away from V5 and V6, that tells you it's going away from the apex. So just a couple of things regarding the diagnosis of arrhythmic cardiomyopathy. It's not straightforward. And when you have uh, task forces put together to do this, it, it typically means that it's not straightforward. And when they have to modify something that was previously, it's not straightforward. So this is a modification of something. In the initial task force came together in 1998. And then there was, um, uh, actually in the 1988, I'm sorry. And then there was a modification of the task force criteria in 2010. So there are major and minor criteria. Uh, the major criteria, the RV are typically related to RV abnormalities, which Dr. Bible will go over uh, uh, soon. Um, typically, we see RV akinesia or dyskinesia or aneurysms. This can be seen by echo or CMR. And there's some specific measurements that are important for this to occur. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Some construction going on above us, I guess. Um, the other thing is um, tissue characterization. So if you do a biopsy, more than uh, less, you'll have less than 60% myocyte, and uh, the rest of it will be uh, fiber fatty infiltrative disease. Um, you will see repolarization abnormalities, like T wave inversions from V1 beyond V3 is a major criteria. Uh, uh, sorry, there was a typo here. The uh, depolarization abnormalities that is also noted is the epsilon wave that I told you about. And then if you see VT with a left bundle branch block, and superior axis morphology, this is usually also a major criteria. Although in patients of LV involvement, the VT with the right bundle branch block morphology can also be considered. Um, and then family history. If you have ARVC that is confirmed in a first degree relative who is alive or at autopsy, or a patient has the proband has a pathogenic disease causing mutation, this is also considered major criteria. And then these same things that just don't meet criteria, but are trending towards that becomes minor criteria. So if you see mild regional uh, wall motion abnormalities um, that don't fit the exact measurements that is suggested, or the tissue characterization shows that only partial fide, uh, fabro, uh, fibro fatty infiltrative disease is noted and you still have more healthy myocardium. Um, the repolarization abnormalities are not clear, they're borderline. You see T wave inversions in V1 and V2, uh, but maybe not out to V3. Um, uh, depolarization abnormalities, uh, you don't see an epsilon wave, but we have uh, a test called a signal average EKG, which can show uh, late depolarization signals, um, could be considered minor criteria. If you have RVOTVT, which is typically seen in normal hearts, but in some patients, this could suggest ARVC. And again, family history, ARVC history in first year relatives who are alive, or pathogenic uh, disease causing mutations in second degree relatives, this would be considered minor. So the diagnosis is typically made if you have two major criteria or one major and two minor criteria or four minor criteria. So to be honest, this is obviously always very confusing. And I think at the end of the day, the more number of, uh, of criteria you have that, um, that adds up, uh, the better your uh, chance of diagnosis. And then there's different sensitivities and specificities uh, related to these uh, various criteria that may affect it. And based on the major criteria are typically more specific, but most of these criteria are not very sensitive. Um, usually the sensitivity is less than 80%, although specificity is like over 96%. So the differential diagnosis for ARVCs are many. So anything that causes right-sided VT, like Brugada syndrome, right ventricular alpha tract tachycardias can be in the differentials. Anything that causes structural heart disease on the right side, like congenital heart disease, pulmonary heart hypertension, athletic heart, um, certain chest deformities can cause this problem. And other things that can mimic left dominant ARVC. So other dilated cardiomyopathies, cardiac sarcoidosis is the, is the uh, typical masquerader that sometimes 
uh, mimics ARVC and should be looked for. Chagas disease, which is almost on every differential diagnosis that I've ever read um, in cardiomyopathies and other congenital ventricular aneurysms. So at this point, um, I'm gonna set it, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Baibo, who's gonna talk about the imaging and genetics, and then I'll finish up with the therapy with a, a one slide. Thank you, Mohan uh, and Sam. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. So I'm gonna talk briefly about the imaging and uh, some genetics of arrhythmogenic uh, cardiomyopathy. So um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, as Mohan said, is an inherited condition where there is fibro fatty myocardial replacement, predominantly of the RV, but uh, we are seeing more and more cases of uh, isolated left ventricular involvement or biventricular involvement. And it's actually one of the leading causes of sudden death in young people. And the diagnosis, especially in early stages of the disease, can be challenged. Um, 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 and this is based on history. Uh, genetics, uh, EKGs, as uh, Mohan uh, showed, and uh, also imaging. And uh, cardiac MRI imaging has really helped uh, detect some of these cases. Sensitivity of uh, endomyocardial biopsy is low uh, because uh, it usually predominantly, most cases involve the RV free wall. Uh, there is patchy involvement and trying to biopsy the RV free wall is not without risk uh, with concerns for cardiac perforation. Um, so uh, the yield for biopsy uh, is low uh, because of patchy involvement, involvement of the RV free wall and risk of biopsy itself. Uh, so this is a histopathological slide. And what we see here is a normal myocardium of the RV on this side in slide A. And on slide B, we see someone with ARVC. And uh, uh, just fatty replacement is not sufficient uh, morphological hallmark of uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Uh, what we need to see is both uh, uh, fatty as well as fibrous replacement. Uh, and what we see here when we stain the myocardium in a patient, uh, this is a um, you know autopsy sample with a azan trichrome uh, stain. What we see the blue um, is our fibrous tissue and white is our fatty tissue. Um, a red is uh, the normal myocardial cells here. So what we see is that in this case there is extensive fibro fatty replacement uh, of the myocardium and there is progressive myocardial atrophy with time. Uh, so uh, the original phenotype was characterized by RV involvement, but it can present as biventricular or left dominant forms. And on a recent autopsy series, it was noted that 76% of the patients had actually LV involvement. Uh, hence, uh, we are kind of moving away from the term ARVC, uh, which stands for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy to actually arrhythmogenic uh, uh, cardiomyopathy. And disease progression may not be continuous ongoing process. Uh, there may be times where things worsen um, and patients actually can have episodes of my similar to myocarditis. Uh, so in some patients, it may be a continuous process, but in some others, it, there may be uh, times uh, with ARVC or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy when condition worsens from time to time. Uh, so the natural history of classical ARVC, if there's such a thing as classical ARVC, there is a concealed phase where there are no RV structural abnormalities, but sudden cardiac death can still occur at that time. And making a diagnosis uh, in this concealed phase may be very different, uh, may be very difficult because they may not have the EKG abnormalities, they may not have a lot of PVCs, they might not have symptoms, but the presentation can uh, be a still sudden cardiac death. Then we have clinically overt disease where we have arrhythmias and we have RV structural and functional abnormalities, which we can usually uh, detect um, uh, by imaging uh, and on uh, EKGs and monitors. And then the third phase is RV dysfunction with preserved LV function where there is 
progressive RV failure with uh, decreased RV contractility and eventual uh, the terminal stages by ventricular pump failure. Uh, so moving on to the, some of the genetics of uh, 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 ARVC or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, it can be seen in one in 5,000 in general population. Uh, in certain areas of Europe, it can be up to one in 2,000. Um, and approximately 50% of the patients have a positive family history of um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Um, and there is incomplete penetrance and limited phenotype expression. So although most of the inheritance uh, in the non-syndromic um, ARVC is uh, through um, uh, uh, autosomal dominant uh, 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 inheritance, but uh, there can be phenotypic uh, expression variability and incomplete penetrance. So it's a heterogeneous uh, disorder. They're both syndromic and non-syndromic forms. Uh, it's typically autosomal dominant inheritance. There are some autosomal recessive forms, uh, which are uh, some of the syndromes which I'm gonna talk about, as well as non-syndromic forms. And it is usually more malignant in the men, and this is not well understood, which it may be because of the hormonal differences between men or women, or uh, uh, it has also been hypothesized that maybe men are more active and exercise more, and they have overt manifestations of ARVC. It is interesting to note that uh, the lady that we presented uh, was a little older than the typical presentation of uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, but she used to hike. Um, and exercise has shown to be associated with uh, uh, present, uh, presentations and manifestations of ARVC. Uh, so the first description of the genetic analysis in patients with ARVC uh, came from um, uh, this uh, group of people in uh, uh, this island uh, in the Aegean Sea um, um, along uh, uh, near, the, near Greece. Uh, it's called uh, the Naxos Island. And uh, in ancient times, Naxos was predominantly uh, the predominant uh, island of, in the Aegean Sea, and they uh, used to export a lot of marble uh, to temples uh, in Greece. And then what happened is uh, that in around 1200 uh, AD, there was decline in trade and eventually uh, this island was annexed by uh, Venice. Um, and at that time for some cultural regions, uh, the Naxians uh, kind of uh, uh, married uh, among other Naxians, not close relatives, but uh, among other Naxians. And uh, there was a folklore um, in, um, uh, in that island that uh, if you're born with woolly hair, and if you're born with uh, this uh, palmo plantar keratoma, then you might die young. <coughs> Um, and through subsequent genetic, uh, genetic analysis, we have found that this is uh, uh, related to this mutation, JUP encoding uh, mutation in the placoglobin in the desmosome. Um, uh, there are other reports uh, from Ecuador and India, uh, again, similar features, woolly hair um, and uh, stin, skin stigmata. Uh, but this is uh, associated with a desmoplakin gene mutation um, uh, uh, in a different, uh, but in the same uh, uh, genes coding for the desmosome. So most of the genes that are associated with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy are in the desmosomes. Our patient had the PKP2, which is the placophyllin uh, mutation, which is also in the desmosome, but this is autosomal dominant. These syndromic ones, which I talked about, um, um, which were discovered in clusters, uh, are autosomal recessive forms. But we've also come to find out that some of these mutations are not in the desmosome, but in the nuclear envelope, or uh, uh, for example, in the sodium channel. So the SC, SCN5A has also been implicated in Brugada pattern. So although 90, almost 80, 90% of the mutations are in the desmosomal genes, we still have some mutations that we find in patients uh, uh, in non-desmosomal proteins, such as the nuclear envelope. Um, so, um, you know, uh, now I think we have a robust genetics uh, program uh, with uh, uh, Kimberly Provenzano, who provides excellent uh, genetic education, counseling, and testing to our patients. Um, and um, as we test more and more of these patients, especially with uh, genetic cardiomyopathies, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, 
uh, we are surprised um, uh, and um, uh, learning a lot about genetics. Uh, so uh, going on to the imaging part of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, I just wanted to show a normal uh, um, right ventricle. So this is a cine image, MRI cine image. This is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. It's a short axis view. These are non-contrast images. We use uh, uh, inherent, inherent properties of the blood to make the blood bright, but we can see that the right ventricle is here. It's nicely contracting. We are looking for areas of aneurysms, akinesia or dyskinesia or regional dysfunction in the RV. This is what we call a four chamber view. Again, the RV is here. You can appreciate how thin the RV wall is. So trying to biopsy this area, which is commonly involved, can often result in perforation, uh, patient going into a hemodynamic shock from tamponade. Uh, so again, this is a normal RV. Uh, if we look in, uh, and the MRI can really provide excellent image resolution and uh, views of the RV, which we cannot sometimes get with echo. So this is kind of the inflow outflow view of the RV. This is the tricuspid valve. This is the pulmonic valve. And we can see the peristaltic movement of the right ventricle, but the, I don't see any areas of akinesia, dyskinesia, or dyssynchronous right ventricular contraction. And this is another view of the right ventricular outflow tract, where we see the pulmonic valve, the pulmonary artery, and the right ventricular outflow tract. The RV is usually more trabeculated and than the LV, so you see these trabeculations here. So back to our patient. Uh, our patient on echocardiography, when she presented to the hospital, had enlarged RV. So this dimension should be three centimeters uh, on this parasternal long axis view. This is the right ventricular outflow tract, so which was enlarged. And then on apical view, this is again the right ventricle. And just subjectively, you, you can see the, the RV feels, uh, looks significantly larger than the left ventricle. So definite RV dilatation. So we made sure there was no shunt, there was no PE, uh, you know, some of the things uh, we should rule out. Uh, and then when we look at cardiac MRI features, unlike the last right ventricle I showed, which was normal, we see this in the subtricuspid area. This, this is like this crinkling of the myocardium, almost like an accordion uh, of moving on, uh, you know, uh, the musical uh, instrument accordion. So we see this area of focal aneurysm and dyskinesia. And when we look into the RV inflow outflow view, again, we see this area which seems a little aneurysmal and dyskinetic. Uh, um, and then the RV, um, when we look at short axis views of the RV, again, you can see that the RV is not contracting uh, well. It's hypokinetic. Ejection fraction was around 33, 34%. And we see areas of RV that are mo not moving uh, appropriately. Um, Uh, when we look at scar imaging, uh, we did uh, on this scar imaging, uh, anything that is fibro fatty should appear white, but we see the myocardium is nicely nulled. There's no white and black. And on this uh, view as well, we don't see anything, um, uh, anything abnormal here. Um, So, you know, when we uh, sometimes scar in the RV side of things may be hard to analyze because the RV is thin. So we do not see any overt RV uh, scarring. And that may be because the RV wall is two to three millimeters and the spatial resolution is not, to, uh, is not able to evaluate for scar in that thin wall uh, because of partial volume effects. Uh, and But when uh, um, MRI is the gold standard, and what we see is that the RV function EF was uh, significantly reduced uh, when we quantify RV through the various sections in the short axis view. Uh, and patient was positive uh, along with the imaging features and EKG features for this pathogenic uh, mutation. Um, so I just wanted to briefly show some other examples. So this is another example where we see uh, that uh, this was a 45-year-old young woman with frequent PVCs and had uh, palpitations with exertion. So although her RV function was normal, but she had this ab abnormality at the uh, um, apex of the right ventricle and also at the base of the right ventricle in the subtricuspid region where during systole these areas were kind of bulging out. She also, as Dr. Rao showed uh, uh, um, in, that, uh, in our case, she had T-wave inversions which were uh, 
beyond the usual V2, V3. So she had T wave inversions in V3, she had T wave inversions in V4, and then also some T wave flattening in V5. So she was diagnosed uh, with um, ARVC and has a defibrillator and actually has had progressive decline in RV function quite quickly. Um, this is another man who had uh, sustained ventricular tachycardia and presented to the hospital with chest pain. And what you we can see is, again, the RV is very dysfunctional. There are areas of aneurysm, again, accordion sign at the base of the tricuspid, uh, uh, below the tricuspid valve here. This is the short axis view, again, hypocontractile. We also see involvement of the LV. We see that this part of the LV wall suddenly thins and there is fibrofatty infiltration into the LV. So this is a case of uh, ARVC with biventricular involvement. And actually on scar imaging, we can see some epicardial hyperenhancement consistent with fibrofatty uh, replacement of the left ventricle. Um, uh, this is a predominantly left ventricular cardiomyopathy case. So again, uh, this patient also had mitral valve prolapse, but we can see um, um, the base of the LV actually here looks dysfunctional and aneurysmal. And then there is evidence of fatty infiltration with thinning of the LV wall in this segment. So again, uh, ALVC. Um, uh, this is a case, I don't know what it is, but I suspect it's probably ARVC. This patient had um, uh, NSVT, multiple morphologies of PVCs on a Holter monitor. Her RV function was normal, but just at the apex of the RV, there's a small micro aneurysm. So she did not meet full ARVC criteria, only just one minor MRI criteria, but thankfully we placed the ICD because two months later she went into sustained ventricular tachycardia needing anti-tachycardia pacing from her defibrillator. Um, so you know, uh, uh, subtleties like this can really make a difference in patients' uh, life and prognosis. Uh, this, uh, we have to all be always aware of uh, mimics. So this is a patient who initially I thought this was in my earlier inexperienced days, which I thought was ARVC, but turned out to be actually cardiac sarcoid. This patient had epsilon waves, epsilon waves here, uh, which is which can be seen with usually advanced ARVC, but any process that causes advanced RV dis dysfunction can result in epsilon waves. So something to keep in uh, mind. Uh, myocardial infarction with fi fibrofatty replacement can mimic ARVC, but here we see it's in a contiguous coronary distribution of the LAD. Tethering to the sternum of the RV after surgery or something can result in a picture where it looks like ARVC, but it's not. Um, so really we need um, high quality imaging to make sure we are not, uh, um, uh, we are correctly diagnosing and not over calling things. Um, um, this is my last slide. So this is the last um, um, slide. This is um, um, a congenital condition where actually there's no RV myocardium, there's RV epicardium and there's RV endocardium, and this is called Yule's anomaly. And what we see is that the, the RV, um, there's endocardium, myocardium, but there's no uh, endocardium, epicardium, but there's no myocardium. And usually these uh, patients, although it looks like ARVC, they have epsilon waves, uh, but they present with uh, florid heart failure uh, um, related to RV, profound RV dysfunction, usually in childhood or during their teenage years. So um, in summary, um, the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy can have both syndromic and non-syndromic forms. It's a genetically heterogeneous uh, disorder, but most cases are autosomal dominant related to gene encoding uh, mutations in desmosomal proteins. Early detection of disease by imaging is difficult because they might not have structural and functional abnormalities of the RV and LV. Endomyocardial biopsy has low sensitivity and poses risks. And CMR can provide high quality imaging and which is the gold standard for RV and LV volumes and function, but also it provides tissue characterization, uh, which I call it virtual biopsy. So with this, I will hand it over back to Dr. Rao One to finish up. Yeah. All right, so this is gonna take one minute because the treatment is actually relatively simple. Okay, so 
The most important thing is we, we restrict competitive sports and, and any intense physical exertional activity as this can increase PVCs and the risk of VT. Beta blockers are recommended, although the data is very limited. Uh, Antiarrhythmic drugs can be used when you have ventricular arrhythmias. This is palliative. Typically, we use sotolol and in some patients, amiodarone. Catheter ablation can be done for refractory VT, but again, this is uh, completely palliative. And in terms of sudden cardiac death, uh, death risk stratification, uh, the more, if you have arrhythmic events, you are at highest risk, over 10% risk per year of death. Uh, if you have unexplained syncope or non sustained VT or severe RVLV dysfunction, your risk is high, but not as high as if you have arrhythmic events. Um, and then you have minor factors that you have small changes that are noted on EKG or MRI that could uh, suggest you have minor risk. And then you may be a healthy gene carrier or have a diagnosis of ARVC, but you've not had any events and no other risk factors, then you're low risk. So based on the risk, we recommend ICD for secondary prevention if you already had ventricular arrhythmias. ICD for primary prevention, if you haven't had VT or VF yet, but you have major risk factors or some minor risk factors. And if you don't have any risk factors and no events yet, but you just have your healthy gene carrier, then ICD is not indicated. Um, and uh, that's about it. Thank you. That was, you can turn off your presentation if you want. That was fantastic. Uh, we're just about out of time, but there aren't that many uh, questions. I'll read uh, uh, just one question. Dr. Sham says, thank you for the fascinating grand rounds. Great to see cardiologists getting into molecular biology. Are there clinicians, other clinicians, dermatologists, for example, uh, familiar with the non-cardiac manifestations of these disorders so that they can um, uh, diagnose them before you have uh, cardiac uh, manifestations? Are, are, is there an awareness of the non-cardiac manifestation? So uh, 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 that's a great question. Um, uh, so syndromic ARVC where we have skin manifestations or hair manifestations and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is not very common um, uh, because those have been predominantly been seen in small groups of people of the islands of the coast of Greece, uh, some Ecuador, and then a little bit of India. Um, so uh, this is not, that is, it's not a very common condition to begin with, and the syndromic forms with the skin manifestations are not that common. So I, um, you know, um, I, they, they are, they, uh, when I was reviewing, there are some case reports of where uh, skin abnormalities led to the diagnosis, but uh, it's not very common. And the other question here is, is, is transplant ever done for these? Yeah. Do you do heart transplants? So if they have uh, advanced RV dysfunction, which is usually um, um, uh, you know, heart failure where the RV function is uh, very uh, low, uh, less than probably 25%, and they have heart failure symptoms, then yes, these patients should be listed for transplant. So in our patient, what would the prognosis be? What would you estimate her life expectancy? Oh. I'll let Dr. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so basically, because she already had ventricular arrhythmias, her risk of death is 10% uh, per year. So it's pretty high. Pretty high. Uh, the literature says, uh, you know, on initial diagnosis, uh, you know, 0 0.8 to 3.6% per year overall risk of death. But uh, once you have ventricular arrhythmias, it's much higher. So it's a serious problem that we have to uh, follow her very closely. She did have a defibrillator implanted, obviously, because she had ventricular tachycardia. All right. Um, I, I think we're going to call it quits at this point. The discussion could go on, but fantastic presentation, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.